Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. We're talking today with C. Grant Cox III. Grant is a 2011 University of Delaware MFA who makes sculptural installations from found objects that are often brought together in whimsical ways, like a little girl's bicycle that barrels along on a fast-moving treadmill. We love the wildness of this object and its surreal attachment to dreams and memories and to the world of real concrete objects. Grant has shown his art in Philadelphia quite a bit, but he lives in Newark, Delaware. He came up to Philadelphia to talk with us today. Thanks for coming all the way up. So, Grant, you got your undergraduate degree from Southern Illinois University, and it was in painting, Mm -hmm. and now you're making sculpture. So we want to know where you grew up, and how did you switch from painting to sculptural objects? Yeah, I'm from from Southern Illinois, uh, El Dorado, Illinois. It's a small town of 4,000 people. And I drove uh, 50 miles every day to to campus. I started I started painting uh, early on, and started doing these like, or attempting to do these real slick oil paintings, and thought I could be a master. And I, I you know I pretty much failed <laughs> at that, um, mostly because my my puns kept getting into the paintings. And <laughs> Your puns, yeah, puns, and you were making punning paintings. Yeah, yeah, or things, or things of, you know, one-liners. I did. I remember doing a painting in community college, three people on their hands and knees doing the hands above their head and bowing, at this gigantic paper grocery bag, and I called it sacrilegious. Um, oh, oh yeah. that's a groaner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I guess once I once I moved to the university and was driving 50 miles every day, I started like falling in love with everything on the side of the road on my on my commute. So a lot of car parts and tire treads and cans and this on my sounds like a terrible highway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The thing I would get, I would you know just pull over immediately when I saw something and load it into my little Geo Metro. And uh, take it to the studio, and so my my BFA thesis ended up being basically like discarded objects as painting and drawing form. So was it, it was, abstract, or yes. did you have a subject matter? Yeah, so it, it was just... it was very very abstract, uh, very uh, improvisational, uh, Louise Nevelson esque. And it was the objects themselves that were on the canvas or the yeah surface. the panel yeah yeah it was actually a livestock fence. I I would uh, just wire everything to. This is the grid system. Did you find that fencing along the highway, or did um, you buy it? The livestock. No, I, I, I ended up I ended up buying it um, just because of the, the massive quantities I was making. Did you come from a family that had artists in it? Uh, pretty much. My dad was an illustrator. He he illustrated. He went to school for commercial art, but then stopped doing it. Uh, so I got to I got to see his his college work on the walls when I was a kid. And my sister liked to draw from magazines when she was in high school. She was pretty good at it. That influenced me a lot. But my stuff was a lot different than, than theirs. I was drawing, like, Dr. Seuss kind of stuff. Comic creating... books? Did you make your own, like, comic books? Um, Sort of, sort of. They were just they were characters, but I didn't have an attention span to, like, follow through with this character and... I drew this. All right, going, I'm going outside now. I'm going to kick a ball around or go do something. I couldn't sit still. Still can't sit still. <laughs> <laughs> so your works are contraptions, basically. They, yes. They're gizmos of some sort. You have said that they explore notions of the grandiose and the pathetic. Could you expand on that, please? Expand on um, when I started to make things move, it was like kind of this epic, like really hard thing to do and make it work right. And really, they just turned out pathetic. Is that because of the materials? Um, or what makes it pathetic? Well, yeah, largely, largely. And um, and then my falling short, my falling short of actually getting it to to work. You know, and I started to trust my, my like, my terrible building skills and um, started going back to relying on improvisation and immediacy. There's a lot more humanity in that, and facing facing failure is is something that I I love doing now. <laughs> but if it succeeds, you're okay with that, right? Like that bicycle on the treadmill with the the fan that seemed pretty successful. Yeah, but it's about failure. But it is about failure. Yeah, um, 
I definitely had to come repair it a lot. That that was interesting because the first one that I made only lasts two hours, and then I had to rebuild it for the show. I got to design this to to not fall apart every two hours. <laughs> wow. You have a lot of your pieces on um, on a Vimeo site. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, one of the pieces which we saw in Young Country here in Philadelphia mm-hmm. um, is called Tense Negotiations. Yes. And it's a pair of stomping cowboy boots and mm-hmm. his or dancing and yeah. his feet are slightly splayed. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little about your ideas about masculinity and does it how does that relate to failure and patheticness? And- oh, um with with tense negotiations, it was I thinking of spaghetti westerns and the whole saloon entrance, and it's always like the pivotal character or the hero or the or the bad guy uh, coming through the saloon and it stops the music and everybody's like, <gasps> I, I wanted to recreate the the saunter in, you know, then what you discover when you when you hear that sauntering is just this machine that's barely holding itself together and it's all janky and. It, it definitely has some idiosyncrasies that it's trying to be macho but fails. Well, do you believe in in a hero? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe I believe in in trying to be the hero, falling short. Like I think everybody tries tries to make the valiant effort, falls short. So, do yeah. you think your work is at all autobiographical or biographical? Oh yeah, definitely. Are you the stomping feet there? I mean, um, I think you wear cowboy boots. I do. I've yeah, seen you yeah. in them. Yeah, the ones that I'm wearing uh, were the first boots that were. On the piece, um, they were slightly too small for the for the feet that I have on there. So I've got some boots that slide on there a little better. Yeah. Uh, How about the um, the bicycle piece? The bi- Is that did you have a bike as a kid? And- yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and I've always wanted to to try to ride a bicycle on a treadmill. the The thing the thing is, uh, when I wanted to ride a bicycle on the treadmill is when I was a kid, I would have probably gotten a lot of trouble and injured. Um, and I like that notion of giving myself permission to do things now. Like I have the know-how to build things, and I can still play as I did as a child, and create these these devices. Um, and I, I found this really ridiculous um, girl's bicycle, um, which is the bike on the totally hot bike. It came printed on the chain guard, totally hot, and. I got it and I put it on, wired it up to the treadmill. And um, me being older, I know that contact mic works really good on the on the card, and it, you know, I can amplify that and make it sound much more stronger and hilarious. Explain about the card a little bit. The card for those of us who don't know what it is. Oh well, the the card and the and the spokes makes the motorcycle noise. And to have a little girl's bicycle. Sounding like a uh, motorcycle is is pretty funny to me. It's you know changing like I guess that's the that's the macho and the image of the of the girl's bike. The Wizard of Wizard of Oz kind of behind the curtain thing, which is like I'm you know big scary man, and then turn out to be this really jolly nice dude. So let's talk about where you get your materials from now a little more. You go to the dump. Mm-hmm. When we were down uh, at the DCCA symposium on a show that you participated in down there that was called Contraption, mm-hmm. you were on a panel, and at that panel you mentioned that you come from a family of hoarders and that when yeah. you grew up, <laughs> Sorry, you grew Mom. up stumbling <laughs> over stuff. So yeah. tell us about that a little bit and about where you stash your stuff now and okay. your relationship to stuff. Well, when I say I came from a family of hoarders, it's more of uh, um, not necessarily. And there's no there's no pets getting buried behind uh, under newspaper or anything like that. Um, Do you watch just, the show? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I've I've caught some I've caught some episodes. Uh, <laughs> we we end up with a lot of furniture, like just because they're all like heir, like heirlooms, I guess, from family. And we have a small house. My mom likes to take. Likes likes to have the things from you know our passing relatives and like that was worth a lot of money that hand you know it was hand built or very valuable or, or sentimental value, so we end up with a lot of that kind of thing. Um, also, she sells Avon, so then there's boxes everywhere. Uh. <laughs> so where do you store your stuff now? Do you have a little 
stash somewhere? Yeah, I have. I have a. I have a, my studio in in Newark is it's pretty sizable, two car garage roughly, and I just find ways of stacking. The way I work is very improvisational, and I, I never really go out to buy things from the hardware store. There's something that's already uh, already exists in a piece of something. You know, I could just take it apart. You know, track system and just pull a drawer out. You know. So, d- so do you not go to the store to get like electronic parts or gears and stuff like that? Um, no, I that that's that stuff. I have to I have to wire up myself because it's it's a little harder to reverse engineer a lot of that stuff. Well, at least I'm not I'm not that skilled. Do you so. let the objects inspire you, or do you have an idea? for what you want to make first and then you look around and see if you have the objects to make it. Um yeah, I definitely get inspired by by certain things. I recently I found a pencil sharpener, like an old hand crank one and it, and it just uh, reminded me of that was like how I got a break from my chair at school, you know, grade school. I was like I got to get up. All right, this pencil's sharp, but I got to uh, all right, I got to get up and sharpen this pencil again. And so like, you know, I got a little butt freedom there and <laughs> sit there and sharpen and sharpen and sharpen and sharpen and sharpen and then I can go sit down uh, so I had this idea of like what why not prolong that and so right now in my studio I'm figuring out how to cut and glue uh, an extended pencil you know upward to 15 feet long and then make a device that hand cranks it so it's it's a time piece you know so I, I it's a lot it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, you know dancing with dancing with the materials that happen upon me you know i don't i don't i don't necessarily go out hunting um but i'll be outside for a walk and i'll be like oh yeah look at this my little pony or look at this they're only selling this thing for five bucks i probably should take it since it's i've already made three pieces in my head with it you know um (laughs) So do you make any sort of music? There seem to be some musical um, objects at any rate that appear in some of your works, drums and mm-hmm. cymbals and things of that nature. And the disco ball at the, the disco pickup ball. truck. Yeah, X-ball. right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I definitely like to play guitar. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a musician. I don't perform live or anything like that. Um, but I think I think sound is a very interesting medium. It's it's very deceptive, uh, which I, I think is with uh, the cowboy boots and the card and the spokes and and totally hot. Foley artists are are great. I I, I love foley artists and and. Um, Can you explain what that is? A foley artist uh, puts the sound into the movie. Um, there's, there's an example on YouTube of a Foley artist working, and it's this really beautiful girl crossing the street in high hills, and then it pans over, and there's this, like, hairy buff dude in high heels, just like, clack, 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 clack. Um, so I'm really I'm really interested in that, in that juxtaposition of hairy, sweaty man and sleek, beautiful girl crossing the road. So, you know, what, what, we're, what we're seeing uh, on the... T- on, TV is not even the real sound. <laughs> so the the there does seem to be a kind of theme running through your work, though your body of work. Mm-hmm. Do you think there is? Yeah, uh, it's it's mainly um, yeah mainly about failure and observing my idiosyncrasies. Maybe it's just about making fun of myself. Um, <laughs> is it about I, childhood at all? Yeah, think? yeah, definitely because. Um, because I still have held on to my ability to play and need to make things, and that need to make things is how I, how I cope with the reality around me. Uh, thank you for talking to us. We've been talking to C. Grant Cox. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It was great, Grant. <laughs> thank you. Our blog radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.